Yo, welcome to R Squad episode 78. We've been studying the book of James for the past couple of weeks, and so we're continuing today, James chapter two. This entire video is gonna be about James chapter two. If you are like, what happened to James chapter one? And you get a chance to listen or watch last week's video. I'd encourage you to watch that video if you haven't already watched it yet so that you can kind of get up to speed on what's going on and then come back to this one for James chapter two. So two main sections in James chapter two. The first one talking about the sin of partiality. And then the second one talking about faith and works. Grab your Bibles, grab your notebook, grab your notebook. All right, so section one, the sin of partiality. I gotta look up partiality because it's like a big word, so. All right, here it is. It says this, partiality is unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared with another. It's favoritism, it's discrimination, it's prejudice, it is unfairness in the way that we treat and see people. So James kind of gives this little illustration. He says, look, if this rich guy shows up at one of your houses and he's got all this nice jewelry on. Nope. Julie. All these nice jewelry on and all these rings and he's wearing nice clothes, you're going to give him the best seat in the house and you're going to give all your attention to that guy. But then what happens if a poor guy shows up, a homeless guy, someone who hasn't showered in a while and they're all disheveled and they look kind of gross? What are you going to give them? Like, you're just going to make them stand over there? You're going to make them sit on the ground next to your nasty feet? And James says in verse four, if that's the way you're going to act, if that's the way that you're going to treat people, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments about people are guided by evil motives? Is, is all you're thinking about just being friends and just showing attention to people who are rich so that they can help you out? So James is kind of looking beneath the surface here. He is not getting at just the way these people treat other people. He's asking them the tough question of why do you choose to treat people? People the way that you treat them. What are your intentions? What are your motivations? What are your desires? What are you looking to get out of it? So this actually brings up a question that I'm kind of really interested in. And I want to know your answer like in the comments so you can just let us know. And the question is, if you do something good with the wrong motives, does it still make what you did good? Yeah, these are my only intentions. Let's put it this way. Say that you and your friends are cruising down the road and you see a grandma who is stuck at the intersection and she needs some help across the road. There she is right there, bam. So we got grandma and she needs some help crossing the road. Now maybe if you were by yourself, you wouldn't really think anything of it or you'd just kind of look the other direction and act like you didn't see grandma over there and you would just drive right by. But today, you're with your friends and you feel for whatever reason like you need to stop. So you stop, you go over to grandma, you help her across the road. That's so kind of you. Hold up. Why'd you help her? Really? Did you help her because you wanted to do something nice? Because maybe you thought she might slip you $20 bill after it was all said and done. Did you help her because your friends were there and you wanted them to see you as a good person, as a nice person? Or did you help her so that after it was all done and over with, you could take out your phone, snap that selfie with grandma, so that you could post that to your Instagram page and tell everyone the story of what you did so that you'd get likes and adoration and praise and everyone would see you to be an angel. <sighs> kind of joking, but I'm kind of not joking because all of us, right, at different points in time have found ourselves in one of these situations. I may be doing a good thing. I may be serving other people. I may be doing a kind deed. I may be helping somebody out. But my intentions, my motives, really expose and show what is in my heart. The Bible says that man, like humans, look at the outward appearance. They look at the good deed, but God looks at the heart. He looks at the deed, but he also looks at the motivation. He also looks at the intention behind the deed. What James is trying to show to these people is that partiality isn't just a sin because it shows that we view some people as better than other people, but it's also a sin because most of the time what it reveals is that we're actually just really selfish 
And the only reason we treat people certain ways or view people in certain ways is really just because of what we think that they can give to us about how we can take advantage of what they have to offer and benefit and profit from it. James brings everybody back to the old classic teaching of Jesus, which is love your neighbor as yourself. But unfortunately, a lot of people only ever see other people as objects that they can use to get them to wherever they want to go in life. And that's not the way that Jesus views people, and that's not the way that followers of Jesus should view people. I want to think about this for a second, because I think it's a really big deal. When I post to Instagram, I got to think, is what I'm getting ready to post actually there to help other people and to contribute to their well-being, or is all I'm really after the likes and the comments and the follows and people telling me I'm a great person or people telling me how good I look in this picture. I'm sorry if that maybe hit a little close to home, but I want you to see that this book right here, it speaks directly into 2020. People have been struggling and dealing with the same things for thousands and thousands of years. I think that's enough for part one, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to part two. Welcome to part two. Get your notes out, get your Bible. We're kind of getting into like some good stuff right here. So you're going to want to take some notes for sure. Question before we look at the Bible. How do we show someone that we have faith? So what I love about this section starting in verse 14 is that James is really like telling you straight up what he thinks, what you should think, what you should believe. And I like it because it's just honest. It's to the point. There's no way you could read what we're about to read and be like, hmm. I wonder what that's about. The title here is called Faith Without Good Deeds is Dead. So this is what verse 14 says. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? So James goes on to kind of describe this scenario where he says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. You know, I kind of picture, I don't know, a homeless person maybe that you'd see on the side of the road. He says, what if you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, you know, find something to eat. I hope, I hope things work out for you. But you don't give that person food. You don't give them any clothing or a jacket. What good does that do? He's like, you say you have faith, but you're not even willing to give somebody the shirt off of your back. Here's the bottom line. Here's the point that James is trying to make. Verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Whew. All right, so you're, you're going to really need your notes because this, this part is really important because we're explaining something that's pretty crucial to understand as someone who follows Jesus or someone who's interested in learning more about faith and Christianity. It's the classic age-old debate of which one do I need? Do I just need faith in God or do I need good works and good deeds and actions? Scripture seems to make it pretty clear that having faith in Jesus and what he did uh, as a man on the earth, when he went to the cross, he died, he was buried, he came back to life, he defeated death. Faith, that thou that happened, that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, that that allows you to be saved by grace and spend eternity with God one day. Yeah, that's correct. But you see, James is addressing a very specific issue with a lot of people who said they believed in Jesus, but their lives and their actions just didn't line up. And so what was happening is that back then, and if I'm honest, a lot of times still today, people reduce faith down to an intellectual agreement between them and God. Or some people reduce faith down to an emotional response from hearing the gospel and making a decision around it. Now, I believe James would agree that faith is an intellectual agreement. It is an emotional response, but he doesn't want people to miss out on the fact that it is also willful obedience to God and his word. It is possible to have a dead faith. Like that is actually possible to have. Verse 19 says, some of you say you have faith for you believe that there's one God. You know, a lot of, th there's a lot of people in the world who would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I have faith. I, you know, I believe in God. But, but he goes on to say, good for you. 
even the demons believe this. Like, even, even the people who are against God know that God exists and they believe that he exists and they tremble in terror. How foolish, can't you see that faith without good deeds, without actions, is useless. It doesn't make an impact in the world in any way. It's just stuck to yourself. It's a belief in God, but it's not an obedience to let him be uh, the Lord and, and in control of your life. Now, something important to kind of star in your notes here is that good actions and good deeds, they do not save us. There's no way we can do enough good things to reach the standard of perfection that God has and that God is. We are saved by our faith in the work that Jesus did on the cross. He he did for us what we could never ever do for ourselves, which was to be perfect, to live a sinless life, to be right with God. And so Jesus takes the sin of humanity all onto himself so that we can continue to have relationship with God. We're not saved because of our good works, we're saved in order to do good works. After a few verses, James says, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. James doesn't want people back then and he doesn't want people in the here now to think that faith is all about a one-time belief in God that doesn't actually change all of us. No, James says that our faith is made alive, active, and complete when it works <laughs> when it works alongside the good works, deeds, and actions that we do in the world. Thank you so much for tuning in to James chapter two. I know, I know maybe some of this stuff is like a head scratcher. So uh, if you got any questions, leave a comment or, or get in there and read James two for yourself and see what it says. We'll see you next week for week three. Bye.